everyone. Um, so I think that we will maybe uh, just get started because uh, I know people will be are still arriving in this virtual space. Uh, before we get started, I just want to um, show in this virtual environment that um, I, I have tobacco and I have a tobacco uh, twine and I'm going to be actually offering this as a gift here in Chibuktuk where I am um, in gratitude for everyone attending and gratitude as well for um, Julie Pels uh, Pelissier Lush, who will be uh, welcoming us here to this workshop series. So, Julie, thank you so much. Gwe, Jalasi, Ndeloisi Julie. Hello and welcome. My name is Julie. I have started a smudge here next to me, but as protocol, it's going to be over there and not on camera. But I do want to share a poem that was written by Noel Knockwood. And it's about the seven sacred teachings. So I'm going to start with that. O oh, great spirit, who before all else and who dwells in every object, in every person, in every place, we cry unto thee. We summon thee from the far places into our present awareness. O oh, great spirit of the north, who gives wings to the waters of the air and rolls the thick snowstorms before thee who covers the earth with sparkling crystal carpets above whose deep tranquility every sound is beautiful. Temper us with strength to withstand the biting blizzards, yet make us thankful for the beauty for which lies deep over the warm earth in its wake. Great spirit of the east, the land of the rising sun, who holds in your right hand the years of our lives and in your left, the opportunities of each day and the hopes of each year. O great spirit of the South, whose warm breath of compassion melts the ice that gathers around our hearts, whose fragrance speaks of distant springs and summer's days, dissolve our fears, melt our hatreds, kindle our love into flames of true and living realities. Teach us that he who is strong is also kind. He who is wise tempers justice with mercy. And he who is truly brave matches courage with compassion. O great spirit of the West, the land of the setting sun, with your soaring mountains and free wide rolling prairies, bless us with knowledge of the peace which flows the striving and the freedom which follows like a flowing robe in the winds of a well-disciplined life. Teach us that the end is better than the beginning and the setting sun glorifies not in vain. O great spirit of the heavens above us in the day's infinite blue and amid the countless stars of the night season, remind us that you are vast, that you are beautiful you are majestic beyond all our knowing and telling, but also you are no further from us than the tilting upwards of our heads and the rising of our eyes. O oh, great spirit of Mother Earth, beneath our feet, the master of metals, the germinator of seeds, the storer of all the Earth's unreckoning resources, help give us thanks unceasingly for your present bounty. O great spirit of our souls, burning in our hearts yearning and in our innermost aspirations, speak to us now and always so that we may be aware of the greatness and goodness of your gift of life and be worthy of this priceless privilege of living. I am Mi'kmaq and I reside in this beautiful territory known as Mi'kma'ki. And I would like to welcome all of you in peace and friendship. And I'll add one quick song because although it's virtual, we are still gathering. So it's nice to have a gathering song to put us all on the same page. Now, Maui, oh me. <laughs> 
now Maui Omi Waiaheo Taho Mulalio and thank you and hopefully this starts off the day in the right way and you move forward in a good way. Thank you. Well, Alan, Julie, so much. That was, thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for Lalan. Um, wow. <laughs> okay. I, I, you're, yeah, I, you are a poor, you're a poet laureate as well, I should mention. And I've been actually sort of reading on your poetry since, since Jordan, because it, it's just quite beautiful. And I encourage everyone to, uh, actually, I think Nimbus actually published your work as well. I just want to, I just want to put a plug out there for your poetry, if that's okay. <laughs> it's really beautiful and really touching. Thank you. Well, Alan. Um, great. Uh, so, so I, I am just going to uh, very quickly, my name is Solomon. I'm here. Uh, I'm one of the co-coordinators for the event. I'm in here in Chibuktuk in Mi'kma'i. And I just want to again express my deep uh, gratitude for being able to, um, you know, uh, be here and conduct, help co-conduct this virtual workshop. And um, I just wanna, again, uh, reiterate that I'm here on unseated, and I'm a guest here in unceded territory, Mahi and Chibuktuk, and uh, again, express my deep gratitude. I, I would like to just quickly show folks um, the website here so we can just maybe go over a little bit what's gonna be happening this weekend. Um, so the website address is here. I believe most of you probably should have had access to that. And um, on this website are the specific uh, Zoom links. Now, one thing I wanna make uh, sort of clarify is that every Zoom link is unique. So every meeting will have a specific Zoom link. So please just click onto it um, for information on uh, to, to access the, the panels. So today we have a workshop on mapping the museum um, and at two o'clock we're going to have a wonderful artist talk with some incredible artists who will be joining us. Um, and then tomorrow we will be having a workshop, which is um, being conducted as well by Angela Henderson, who will be speaking soon. And on the website here, you will find access to information about some of the materials for the workshop. So we have provided a link for the Confederation Center for the Arts website, as well as a link here to um, a folder that has some uh, incredible um, some photos as well by. Uh, um, by Emily, um, I know as well, Ben Wasori, and um, there are photos here of the Confederation Center. So there, uh, Angela will go through this as well during her talk to access um, material for the research creation workshop that'll be going on on Sunday. And then we're gonna conclude at two o'clock uh, an afternoon workshop, uh, which will be facilitated by uh, Dr. Carla Tonton with uh, Dr. Julie Nagam, um, uh, Dr. Heather Igliariate, and Aidan Gillis. Uh, they will be doing sort of like a panel on uh, curation of the HD colonization. Um, I want, if there's anyone who wants, pre-registration is required for the research creation workshop that will be at 10 o'clock. And you can see here that our incredible uh, research collaborator, Jordan uh, Bolio will, his email is there. So if you would like to register for this and registration is required so I can add you as a panelist so we can share your screen. Um, and just please contact Jordan if you would like to register. We really would welcome you to, to join us. Um, for that research creation workshop. Great. So on that note, I would like to pass uh, on the virtual, I guess, virtual baton on to Angela Henderson, who will be leading us through a, uh, a workshop uh, uh, on counter mapping and mapping. So thank you, Angela. I think you're on. You're muted, Angela. Sorry. Thank you, Solomon, and um, well, Alan, Julie, for the, the warm welcome. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I'm just going to start by sharing my screen with you. Okay. okay. So the presentation um, that I've prepared for you today is part of a larger project that looks at the complexities of existing monuments, specifically how they purposely erase difficult histories in favor of aggrandizing dominant historical narratives. So 
In a Canadian context, we often see this erasure exemplified in the names of um, colonial figures and historical events that we commonly see monumentalized in public space. Um, we can think of the form of uh, public statuary, street names, um, and also public architectural projects. So this, this two-day workshop um, event is being done in collaboration with Abbott Brown Architects, who um, are the, the architects who are working with the Confederation Centre of the Arts in the redesign of their architectural space. And so while the, the CCOA, the, the center is undergoing um, a partial redesign to its physical space, we have um, an opportunity here to think together about how cultural spaces might be shaped physically and programmatically through um, critical creative practices. So at the heart of this workshop is the idea of cultural spaces as living monuments. And to, I want to um, kind of take this time to think about that by looking to artists' work who start from embodied perspectives. So by looking at, at the following works that we will see in this presentation, um, we can start to think about how the concept of monumentality can be broadened beyond these sort of dominant uh, colonial narratives that we see put in place. Um, so the CCOA, that's the, the building you're looking at here, um, this image was taken shortly after the um, project was completed. It's built in an architectural style known as brutalism. Um, some people love it, some people hate it, but it was quite a popular um, architectural style in the mid 20th century from the 1950s up until the 1980s. And we especially see it in, in civic projects and institutional buildings that were built to mark the centenary of the establishment of the nation of Canada. Uh, formally, brutalist architecture, um, it establishes the right of materials and structure to be seen, admired, and even celebrated. Um, when I look at these, these um, buildings, the, the heavy sort of imposing materials and forms of brutalist, brutalism, sorry, offer a compelling narrative uh, to, or sorry, a compelling parallel to the dominant narratives of colonial conquest that, that we see really littered across landscapes in Canada. And just to give a little more context, um, the Confederation Centre of the Arts is actually a national memorial, and it was founded to commemorate the anniversary, anniversary of the uh, 1864 Charlottetown Confederation Conference and the Fathers of Confederation. And then in 2015, the CCOA was the recipient of the prestigious 2015 Prix de Vontien Siecle for its enduring excellence and national significance to Canadian architecture. And in awarding this prize, the jury stated, this memorial complex in both form and concept continues to capture the spirit and imagination of our great nation. So, to identify the center as a living monument to the history of Confederation requires a close examination of this difficult and contested history. In his, in his lecture for the 2019 Simmons Medal delivered at the Confederation Center of the Arts, Senator Murray Sinclair discusses the impact of Confederation when he says, understanding who you are, where you come from, where you're going, why you're here, that teaching is a very important part of Ojibwe culture. But all of the children who were taken away from their families in our tribe were denied access to that knowledge. They were placed in schools where they were told that teaching that knowledge, that those teachings in the language that was fundamental to understanding those teachings, that was all rubbish, that was irrelevant. The only teaching was through Christianization and civilization in the way, white man's way, and therefore everything that you had been taught, everything that you may have known, everything that your parents would have wanted you to know was not worth knowing anymore. And yet I can assure you, we all grew up thinking, hoping, believing that there was more to our life than what we had been told. Confederation was the beginning of a relationship between us that took away from me took that away from all Indigenous people. So 
In order to facilitate critical conversations about this space, a monument to Confederation, its redesign and its future trajectory of how, the future trajectory, sorry, of how cultural spaces can look, I want to sort of look at this concept of countermapping as a means of introducing critical perspectives and making way for more inclusive conversations. So before we talk about countermapping or look at examples of artistic works, um, let's first think about maps. So the implicit violence of the map that's shown here really illustrates the power structures that facilitated dispossession on Turtle Island and the settler narrative that is foundational to some of the founding principles of Canada's Confederation. When we think of maps and we can think of, um, you know, navigational tools, but generally maps are drawn used by and used by governments and corporations to claim property and to assert legal rights. Whereas counter mapping is a practice that is uh, divergent. It demonstrates efforts to map against dominant power structures. And it's engaged, a practice that's engaged in understanding how space produces meaning and how meaning is in turn produced by space. That a map is a living document rather than an immutable authority. So in this presentation, I'll share with you artists whose work broaden the concept of mapping by relating to place through embodied perspectives while also exploring place through familial histories and philosophical inquiries to create their work and to broaden understandings of place. Just to give you a short background about me, I'm a Canadian, uh, settler Canadian artist living and working in Djiboutuk, uh, the unceded and unsurrendered territories of the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples, also known as Halifax, Nova Scotia. And I'm part of this research group presenting the workshop this weekend, as I said earlier. <laughs> Um, counter mapping is something I'm interested in relational to my own practice. And while, you know, I don't have any answers, I am eager to share with you artists that I've been looking at um, who I find inspirational and give um, a lot of critical thought to the subject. So the first artist that I want to um, introduce you to is uh, Carrie Allison. Carrie Allison is a Cree, Métis, and European descent visual artist, and she's based in Djibouktuk, Halifax, Nova Scotia. And the work you're looking at on the screen here is um, a work from a few years ago entitled the Shubanakadi River Beading Project. And what's interesting about this work is it's, it's an activist work, but it also um, brings together community in a project that was uh, initiated by Allison with the Water Protectors and Stop Alton Gas Group, who currently are occupying space along the Shubanakadi River to protest the destruction of the river's ecosystem. So in this work, Allison invited uh, members of the community at large to come together and to bead under the guidance of the Water Protectors of the Stop Alton Gas Group. Allison describes this project as an honoring of the river space and the river's life system. Many people were, as I said, were brought together to bead the space of the river, which culminated in a 40 foot beading of the Shubanakiti River in what Allison describes as an exercise in building treaty relations between settlers and indigenous nations and humans to mother earth. Then in 2019, the river pieces, you can see the uh, individual beaded pieces as the project began here, were um, completed and auctioned off to raise funds for the Stop Alton Gas Legal Fund. So unlike maps that are drawn for exploitative purposes of um, you know, land division, resource extraction, the work here results in a map that's drawn from connection, not only to one another, but to the land and out of a deep respect for the water that we all depend on. So the next artist um, also proposes participation and collaboration with the public as a means of connecting to place. So Janet Cardiff and George Beers Miller are um, interdisciplinary Canadian artists, and they've developed a series of um, audio and video walks that occupy the, the sort of disconnected space between lived phenomenon and recorded map. 
So I'm going to play for you. Actually, first, I'll give a little bit of context. Um, this work is um, uh, a work where visitors are invited um, to download an app on their iPhone and to trace with the, the phone the same route that Cardiff herself had completed within this particular space. Um, in this case, um, we're looking at the Alterbahnhof in Germany. And for a little bit of context there, um, it was during World War II that the Alterbahnhof was one of the three stations that were used to deport about 55,000 Berlin Jews between 1941 and 1945 to the Theresienstadt Nazi-occupied, um, that's a, a concentration camp, sorry, in Nazi-occupied Czechoslovakia, and then from there onto other uh, concentration camps. So we're just going to watch about a three minute excerpt from this video. Sitting here right now with you in the train station at Castle, watching the people pass by. It's very intimate in ways watching people. You can see how they walk, so you can tell if they're happy or they're sad or lost somewhere in their minds. This video will be an experiment. We like those prisoners stuck in Plato's cave. We watch the flickering shadows on the screen. Try to align your movements with mine. Move your screen up to the left as I do. A red coat. I used to have one. Wonder where it went. So many people wear black here. Garbage pills have moved. You see the musicians? They're between the pillars now. Let's get up. Follow them. close when we need to. Go to the left. Pass the man. Well, the, the sound was terrible. The bombs fell, the houses collapsed, and the, all around me was fire. Every house was burning. And the next morning, bodies lying in the street. Arms, legs, all, all, everything was lying around. So what I think is interesting about this work is it really um, brings together the, or challenges the division between past and present. Um, you know, the, the people in the train station having downloaded this app to their phone 
you know, they're semi-immersed in the difficult history that this space uh, represents or contains. But at the same time, they're moving amidst this kind of banal everyday life um, of this space that's intended for people in transit. So I think that the in-betweenness of the train station, um, that spatial context provokes a reflection on how physical space carries a multiplicity of narratives across time. And it, the space and the interaction with the space in turn performs a map of first person accounts that are often, as we saw here, you know, I mean, they're interrupted by these sort of um, uncanny situations or these almost uh, diaristic observations. And um, it sort of unfolds in this kind of unexpected montage of the here and now. So walking as a means of, of activating the past is a good way to introduce the next artist. Um, Abadar Kamgari uh, explores um, displacement in relation to the ongoing legacy of colonialism in the West. And Kamgari, when, when she was eight, her and her mother left Iran for Turkey. And as refugees, they eventually ended up um, immigrating to Canada in 2006. So in this work that you see on the screen, um, The Journey West, uh, this took place 13 years after um, leaving Iran. And in this work, Kimgari embarks on an 87 kilometer walk from her mother's home in Toronto, once again, traveling west around Lake Ontario to arrive at her home in Hamilton, Ontario. And through this work, Kimgari reflects on the physical effects of the 27 hour walk. She notes the exhaustion and the pain, but also that the ability of the toiling body um, um, to communicate a certain sentiment is something that language is incapable of. So in the, the journey west over the course of the 27 hour walk, Kimgari is engaged in mapping, both spatially, she traverses the, the uh, concrete terrain, but also as the physical effects of this durational walk come to bear on her emotional experience. During the walk, she, she recalls her early life experience of her and her mother leaving Iran and life in Iran. So in a sense, through these recollections, she's mapping that experience of the past into the space of the present. Um, this this um, effect of direct contact with the landscape uh, where a spatial record emerges at the intersection of memory and place is something um, the next artist also explores. Um, the artist here, Vanessa Dion Fletcher, is a Lenape and Potawatomi neurodiverse artist. And in this work, Writing Landscape, she uses intaglio and lithography which are both uh, traditional European methods of printmaking, where typically um, the copper plate would be etched through a process of acid biting or through like fine mark making with uh, metal tools. But instead, uh, Dion has taken the copper plates and adapted this technique of mark making by cutting them and wearing them on her feet and walking. Um, so this project here, it took place in three locations that are important locations to the artist. Toronto, Ontario, Thamesville, Ontario, and Peng Nirtung, Nunavut. And Fletcher chose these locations specifically for their historical and contemporary significance to her own self. Um, and in each location, she, she says, I walked for several kilometers setting up the shot, walking away from the camera and returning to it. I think this work is an affirmation that I am not fixed in the past or the future, but am able to adapt and create new relationships and new connections with the landscape. In this work, Fletcher is recording the landscape through direct engagement on the land and in contemplation of her relationship to the land. And as she traverses the landscape, the copper plates cut to fit the size of her feet, they bear the marks of place, but also of time, according to um, their, their, I guess the recording are accounting for uh, the change in terrain um, as she moves along the different um, terrains that you see here, for example. 
but also the physical contact between the body and the land. So through, through Fletcher's use of the copper plates in relation to her own body, she's challenging the authority of the printed image because of course these plates would then be used to produce um, you know, a series or a multiple of um, prints. And in doing so, uh, Fletcher's suggesting that the subject of land and history is constantly changing through our interactions with it. And in turn, um, the recording device of the copper plates is subject, also subject to change. So this exploration that we've looked at here of um, kind of archiving, I would say, through material practice is something that um, we can see also in the work of David Woods. Um, David Woods uh, co-curated uh, with Harold Pierce, or sorry, um, yeah, um, the exhibition uh, in this place, Black Art in Nova Scotia. And that was in 1998 at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, the Annalee and Owens Gallery, sorry. And this in, in, exhibition, it was um, a virtual survey of art dating back as far as 1886 from both urban and rural Black communities throughout the Maritimes. And the, the co-created um, exhibition had a kind of interesting inclusive curatorial strategy where Woods brought together craft and fine art, fine art objects into the exhibition, including quilts. So David Woods works um, you know, today with traditional quilt makers to document, to preserve and to narrate African Nova Scotian histories. Well, other quilts in um, an upcoming or an exhibition that's happened and will happen again, the secret codes were used as a, a wayfinding system during the Underground Railroad, mapping the road to freedom. So as a um, you know, multidisciplinary creator, uh, poet, painter, storyteller, Woods has collaborated with quilters such as Laurel Francis and Myla Dorrington and curated quilts from communities across Nova Scotia, um, such as North Preston, Weymouth, Shelburne, and New Glasgow. And that um, curation, that collection of works um, was put together in the exhibition, The Secret Codes. And that exhibition will be going on a national tour starting in early 2022 at the Confederation Center um, Art Gallery in, in Charlottetown. <clears throat> So moving on to um, our next artist, um, Julie Meritu is an American artist whose work um, departs from an observation of um, a lived experience <laughs> of architecture in the city. And uh, Meritu is particularly interested in densely populated urban environments of the 21st century. So, you know, as you spend time with um, Meritu's canvases, you can see different architectural features emerge. We see columns and um, facades, porticos. Um, we can see sort of different geological schema, such as charts and building plans and city maps and renderings. Um, and then we see them all from these sort of multiple perspectives. We're looking at aerial views, cross sections, isometric views but we're looking at them simultaneously, which in a way sort of flattens this grid that is um, so commonly associated with design and uh, urban planning. So in this work, you know, Meritu creates a new historical and spatial narratives by using abstracted images of cities, histories, wars, and geographies. And in describing her work, Meritu described or says of the canvases that they're story maps of no locations, seeing them as pictures into an imagined rather than actual reality. So in these works, you know, Meritu uses different techniques to create a sense of layering, of compression, of um, time and space and place together. And erasure is a technique that is um, you know, um, commonly found in Meritu's work, um, where she reflects on, you know, uh, how different gestures contribute to absence and whether implicitly or explicitly um, violence manifests itself in the landscape. So moving from um, a kind of dense, deeply urban context, 
The next artist um, is working in a very different way. Um, this work is uh, the work of Christy Balcor, who is a Michif art, a visual artist. And the painting you see here on the screen uh, is a part of a series of paintings that explore Métis and Anishinaabe perspectives of land and water. So in Belcourt's essay, uh, Mapping Root Perspectives of Mapping Root, sorry, Perspectives of Land and Water in Ontario, Belcourt describes these paintings as melding together current day roadmaps with research into original place names, along with other motifs in an attempt to express an Aboriginal worldview and to try to show what cannot be found on today's maps. All of the paintings in this series, which you can find online, um, Belcour is showing perspectives of Ontario that we do not see included in contemporary maps and depictions of this place. Here in this short video, Belcour describes the continuation of this work. Uh, this painting is called A Work in Progress. And it is, as you can see, a painting of the Ontario region. But written on there are uh, original place names. There's about 400 on here. And it is uh, four feet by four feet uh, in size. And it's acrylic on canvas and, and paper. So the original place names that are written on here are in Anishinaabemowin. And uh, down in this region, uh, they're written in Mohawk uh, because that's their territory. And um, there's about 400 of these original names that uh, I researched and was able to put back on the map. When map makers uh, came into this territory, they, they didn't bother to find out what the original names were that were, uh, that were given to these places by the people who lived there. And they renamed a lot of places in, across North America into English and French names. And so this painting is about reclaiming these territories uh, back for ourselves by using the original place names, acknowledging them and, uh, and, and putting them over top of the English and French names, which were not the original names. So we sort of, um, you know, we mentioned at the outset about how maps are, are drawn and used by governments and corporations to claim property and assert legal rights. And, you know, in the case of Belcour's work here, as she's looking at this map of Ontario, you know, the land has been divided up um, based on who could take what and through what measures of violence. But in this work, uh, Belcour is engaged in an act of reclamation. Uh, naming the land as part of a, um, for her, a continual and ongoing process. And in doing so, she highlights the moral and political imperative of this work. So the next um, artist here that I'd like to share. Uh, this painting is called A Work in Progress. Sorry. Pardon me. Um, the next artist's work that I'd like to look at is Anne McMillan, who's a Canadian artist. Um, and in uh, Macmillan's work, Little Lake, Anne offers a first person mapping of the experience of swimming each of the 22 lake, or sorry, the 20 lakes that share the name Little, La Little Lake in Nova Scotia. So for this project, Macmillan attempted with, um, I don't know, success is the word, varying degrees of success, uh, to swim the perimeter of each of these lakes. She used a GPS tracker that traced her movements at four second intervals. So the, the green lines on the lakes there, what you're looking at is a series of data points. Then she took these data points and they were imported into a GIS, so a geographical information system software, and then distributed onto a grid. And once represented on the grid, single words were assigned to each data point taken from texts written by Macmillan following each swim performance as a reflection on the, the um, act of swimming the perimeter. These works were then compiled into a series of 22 books and each performance was represented in text um, with each word corresponding to a data point. So in this way, this work um, creates a counter map and it's one in which 
uh, the traditional use of GPS technologies is subverted to map her physical and subjective experience of each lake. Following this, um, I'd like to look um, at an artist, a Danish sculptor named Tova Stork. And in Stork's work, uh, she investigates the, the phenomenological experience of the sculpted object. But in this site-specific work, um, Stork plays with the materiality of the brutalist architecture of the gallery. So with the steel bars here um, that Stork has used, the, this material is um, generally used to create a skeletal structure for the concrete. But Stork, in using it in this way, um, um, kind of reveals, I guess, the, the materiality of the support system of the architecture. So breaking from the sort of Euclidean grid um, of the coffered ceiling, which is a common motif in, in brutalist architectures, um, Stork locates each of the steel bars within the holes and anchors that litter the ceiling from the exhibitions installed in this space over the duration of the gallery's 49 year history. And as the steel bars reach the floor, Stork bends them and trims them in relation to her own body and space. And in this way, Stork maps the archive and, and um, of the, the past works of this space, the archive of, art, of artistic works, by creating an environment where time and space are brought together to redirect the flow of visitors to the gallery. I'm just gonna show you just for the happiness of children's laughter, um, the redirection of this space. <laughs> this is the artist child in this space after the completion of the series of artists uh, is Lindsay Dobbin. Lindsay Dobbin is a Ganyo Gehaga, Acadian Irish water protector, artist, musician, storyteller, curator, and educator who lives and works in Mi'kma'ki. So in this work, um, Dobbin was an artist in residence in the Magdalene Islands. And Dobbin describes the aim of this project, Invisible Paths, to do as a, um, a project that's aimed to develop place responsive methods for art creation that embrace nature's language and cultivate the art of listening. So the work shown here at La Corie Beach uh, shows traces of Dobbin's walk in the sand. And as the sand sings under the steps, under Dobbin's steps, Dobbin begins to walk in a tight circle, responding to the sound coming from the sand. And eventually spiraling outward, Lindsay describes this gesture as an echo of the original footprint. So the work here, and in Lindsay's work, if you, if you visit her um, website, you'll see that embedded in all of Dobbin's work is this slow, deliberate sense of listening. And Dobbin describes their place responsive work in sound, performance, sculpture, and writing as an intention to dissolve surface associations and reveal what is underneath and felt by embracing nature's language and listening as wayfinding. So with all of the artists here, we see how their works adopt varied methodologies that include body, embodied knowledge. Um, the works reveal untold narratives in public space and explore this idea of counter memory, which seeks to make visible the layered histories of difficult history that resonate in the contemporary lives of their communities. So that's the conclusion of um, my presentation. And um, I just wanna take a, a, a brief moment to talk about 
um, the research creation work that follows this presentation. Um, if you haven't already registered, you can contact uh, Jordan Beaulieu. Her um, contact, the contact information is on the website, the event website. Um, and though we're restricted to a time frame of 24 hours, um, I'd like to invite uh, people participating in this workshop to create their own sort of counter monuments as we reflect specifically, or sorry, counter maps, pardon me, as we reflect specifically on the Confederation Center for the Arts. Um, I'm proposing that we use um, either our memories of past interactions with this space or access to the online presence of the CCOA through their website. Um, we've also provided a folder of site plans, floor plans, maps, and photo documentation from PEI artist Emily Benoit. So you can um, use those as source material if, if you um, feel compelled to take, this, take on a, um, a small project. So we're, we're encouraging um, participants to think broadly about their work, uh, to use the medium of your choice, and it can be the smallest of gestures. Of course, you know, there isn't much time and we all have lives. So if you feel compelled, even something very small is, is very meaningful. Um, if you do decide to participate, you can upload your work into the folder um, that we've provided or send directly to Jordan. Um, and then we will access those images for a discussion during tomorrow's uh, workshop. So you're welcome to talk about and share your own work or to participate in as uh, little or as um, big a way as you like. Um, so possible mediums just to kind of maybe get your creative minds thinking. Um, you know, you might think about the use of your um, just pen and paper or telling a story or uh, the iPhone, pictures, um, drawing, found images, collage, found objects. Really, it's uh, unlimited. And to inspire your work, um, or if you want to sort of work from a little bit of um, a prompt or a context, I've, I've created the following prompts that you can address during your, your uh, research creation project. So on the screen, um, you know, this idea of incorporating inside and outside might be a place to start or unite organic and rational, reconcile error, a work that reciprocates, a map drawn from memory, use abstraction as a subject, a map that records felt sensations, Use negative space as a generative device. Combine unrelated parts to form a new whole. Layer different instances of time and place. Look closely at something familiar. So that um, concludes the presentation that I have for you today. Um, I'd like to open up the discussion uh, for questions or comments. Um, yeah, so we'll do that now. Just a quick note for everybody that you can use the Q&A panel if you wanted to ask a question, or we can also enable you to, to ask your question um, via audio if you're an, a, if you're an attendee or a panel. Uh, there's also some people that can activate their video as well. Um, but yeah, so you can type it in the chat or the Q&A. And um, yeah, any, any questions you may have or comments. Okay. It's okay if there's no questions, we can, uh, oh, yeah, so, um, oh, there's the Q&A is opened up, yeah, so, do you see the Q&A there? I'm trying to open it. Uh, um, Melanie there. Okay. I can read it out too. Okay. Uh, Melanie asks, can you tell us about how your own practice fits into these kinds of practices? Oh, is that a good question? <laughs> Um, yeah, for sure. I think um, for me, it's it obviously like practice is practice. It's something that's constantly evolving. Um, currently, you know, I've, I've generally 
coming out of a background of architecture and design. Um, I've always sort of used um, analytical tools and methods to think about um, documenting space and how we experience space. Um, but I've become like increasingly sort of um, not discontent, but wanting more from, from, you know, intrigued by these ideas that I see in other, um, in works such as, such as what I've shown you. So um, I think for me, the way I'm starting to explore some of these ideas is just to, to really practice, is to, to try to move outside of the, you know, the room of my studio and into, um, yeah, physical spaces and to, to sort of, I don't know, try to attune myself more to um, an understanding of place based on what's felt and, and also drawing on um, memory and thinking about <clears throat> tools, you know, de the development of, of tools and how um, to subvert these kind of, um, these kind of uh, materials and tools that I've, you know, typically use that come out of um, a practice in design and architecture. So not necessarily throwing all those things away, but maybe thinking about how they can be um, used in different ways. And um, a lot of it too is collaboration. You know, um, the last um, exhibition that I was part of at the public library was uh, engaged with a, a group of artists who um, were working from these more uh, embodied approaches. So, you know, learning from others and um, trying to really like always go outside of my comfort zone. I don't know if that answers your question or if you wanted me to speak more specifically about work, but yeah, it's sort of a transitional, long-term transitional time for me. <laughs> oh, Melly's asking you to uh, walk, walk through maybe an example of one of your works. Then we have a question from Agri after that. Sure, yeah. Um, should I like maybe share something from my website? Sure, you can even talk about maybe the exhibition that you, that you had in the library, um, maybe one of those works, and then, yeah, and then we have a question from Agre, and yeah, yeah okay. everybody to type in your, your, your questions. Okay, I'm going to just, um, so I'm just going to open up um, one quick project here on my home page. Um, okay, so maybe this is a good one to share. If I can pull this off with the technology. <laughs> um, so I'll share this work. Um, so this work here um, is entitled uh, Foray. Maybe I'll start at the top. Um, and it's composed of um, a series of three works. And essentially um, where this work began was last, um, last year in Warsaw in Poland, um, where I participated with um, a group of artists, ethnographers, researchers, um, and thinking about ways that artistic processes can um, kind of play a role in creating another sort of mapped or cartographic layer to identifying sites of mass murder from the Holocaust, and in particular, the Holocaust by bullets, which, um, you know, um, so we were, we were working in forested spaces where people were, um, you know, murdered on site and um, generally uh, buried in these places. So, um, you know, the work, that work of the Zeppelinier Foundation begins by a witness to the um, murder. So somebody coming forward and, and wanting to sort of reveal or share their knowledge of this space. So that could be a firsthand account or um, an account that's been passed down um, through like an oral history through a family. Um, so these spaces are sort of loosely identified and um, they're the foundation member who, who marks the site is taken there by a witness. And what I found interesting about this process is that the witness often navigates these sort of densely forested areas by uh, landmarks. So they'll look to like, you know, a sort of hilled landscape, um, a large tree, um, things that are in the landscape that allow them to um, kind of reclaim or, or revisit that, that memory or that history. So I, 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 I took that idea of, um, you know, the witness and tried to think about nature as bearing witness. 
So um, in this, in this uh, image that you see here, these, these sticks, um, what they are is they're maps. And so upon you know, arriving in the kind of um, uh, site of this grave as it's identified, because of course these graves can't be um, dug, you know, the bodies lay there at rest and by Jewish holy law, they can't be um, exhumed. So my, my uh, approach was to look um, around the grave for the oldest trees or the trees that would have been present by their age at the time of the murders. And I took um, string, which was just a material that I could find uh, at hand in these their small villages. And um, the black string represents the circumference of the, the witness tree. And then the white string is the distance to the next witness tree. So what they are is they're a perimeter. So they, they return back to the, the, the witness tree, creating a perimeter around the grave. And then, you know, um, at each of those points, I dropped a GPS pin. So coming back to Halifax and um, remounting this work in a different format for Holocaust Education Week, um, I went back into the GPS maps and um, remeasured the, the string um, and then um, restrung these works. But this time um, I was, I took, um, fallen branches or cut branches, sorry, from um, Point Pleasant Park as, you know, locating that as another sort of site of trauma. Um, there's a, a kind of mass silviculture project um, underway in Point Pleasant Park where um, trees that aren't indigenous to the Acadian uh, forest landscape are being cut. So I collected these different um, branches to uh, accommodate the lengths of diff the different um, sites. And um, we had some other questions here, Angela. Maybe we should ask. Yeah. Is, that, is that okay? Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. And also, um, people are saying they can't hear you so well, so you have to speak a little bit louder. Oh, shoot. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, Agre is asking about uh, the work by Janet Cardiff. And, you know, which, and I guess, Agre, if you want to speak, I, um, you know, we could. Uh, Angela could also enable you, uh, do you say you can enable Agre to speak um, in through the uh, words as participants and attendees? So you can ask in person, but I can also read if you, if you would like. Um, there was a, um, a question about uh, Janet Cardiff's um, uh, work and maybe their influence on that sort of new, uh, that, that technology on your work and future work of this sort of counter mapping. So if you wanna talk about uh, Janet Cardiff's work. Yeah, um, I can't see the question. Sorry for all the technical <laughs> issues here. Um, just can you just maybe restate the question? Sure. I love the work of Cardiff. How do you think the future of your practice? How do you how do you think about the future of your practice and its influence? Oh, of Cardiff's work. Oh, that's a that's a good question. Um, I also love Janet Cardiff's work. Um, yeah, I think what 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 stands out for me about her work um, is this this idea of um, mapping one, uh, his, you know, one one um, time onto another, the past onto the present, the present onto the past. So how she really conflates that space, you know, that um, timeline, those years past, and the distance between that history in in the train station, the. Um, expulsion of uh, Jewish people from that um, castle via that train station right into the present. Um, and then, so the mapping of one onto the other is something that, that um, I really think is, is um, effective in the sense that it, it implicates the viewer. The viewer is, um, you know, is, is kind of tasked in a way of making their own connections between their experience in the present and the kind of um, specter, or the historical presence that's always that's always um, present in that space. There, there are several other questions here. Um, I'll read them out for you so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, so this is from, uh, we have Karen and then we have Jordan. So I'll speak with Karen. I'll, 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 uh, even Karen, you can actually activate your video if you wanted to ask your question in person. Um, it's up to you or I can read it for you, whatever you prefer. There we go. Okay, I think you're muted, but uh, we can. Zoya, I'm muted. Hello, good morning. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to ask this question. Um, 
um, all of the things that you showed us and uh, the challenge that you have put out made me start to wonder what was on the site of the Confederation Center before this uh, uh, elevated mausoleum was built. <laughs> I'm sorry, I betray my opinions, but, um, and, and I'm interested if um, any of those histories are in the documentation that are supplied for us to think through these questions. And then I sort of had a further thought because I'm sitting in a space looking out at hundreds of islands that um, are affected by hurricane blowdown. And these become really, really interesting sites because what happens over a period of 10,000 years is that you have something grow up, the hurricane comes through, it blows it down. And then there are these resurgent um, life forms that re-emerge out of that space so that um, it's a cycle, but it's also a space where nothing lasts forever. And so I'm thinking about that as a model as I'm looking at these um, buildings that look as if they're um, you know, supposed to be like the pyramids, they're supposed to be there forever. Um, and wanting to think about what happens when um, there's some pressure on those buildings, what are the resurgent elements that could come up through those cracks? So anyway, that's the context of that of that question. Yeah, um, you know, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know what was there before the, <laughs> the Confederation Center was built, but I think um, I am up for that challenge to try to, you know, following this presentation to put some of that doc information, which I'm sure can be found into the, um, into the um, folder. Um, but I think this, this idea, like even the, the artist work that I sh I've shown in this presentation, what really strikes me about it in relation to the um, kind of materiality, the heaviness, the permanence, the immutability of this center is it's so radically opposite in its gesture. You know, it, it doesn't place a firm foot on the ground. It doesn't you know, it doesn't pour a foundation, it's fluid, it's constantly moving in all of these practices. And that's what gives it shape. So I, I think like when you talk about the cracks and the fissures that emerge and, you know, in a sense, not to be too dramatic, but what can bring these, these kind of structures um, into kind of, I want to say down, but that's not really what I mean, like exactly. But, you know, let's, let's, you know, say maybe can undermine or can open up in a way. Um, I think it is these kinds of practices that that aren't, you know, um, hitting you with a hammer or like, you know, proposing, um, you know, this grand gesture. And it more so than that, I think it's the culmination or the, you know, the kind of, yeah, the amount of these kinds of, of gestures. Um, and I think a lot of that comes through, you know, what will be the conversations that follow um, this today, you know, artistic practices that interrogate and um, critically interact with the museum. And, you know, if I think if cultural institutions and, you know, Canada is a larger idea is serious about um, the TRC's calls for, for action, then we would invite these kinds of um, conversations and these kinds of critical perspectives into the doors as a means of kind of um, shifting and creating change that way. Cool. Well, I was, I was also thinking about this as a gender as it, well, it's certainly gendered. Um, but it's also, of course, very much informed by an imperial mandate or a colonial mandate, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna um, last for all of time in this, mm -hmm. in this um, space, but but it also is really about the fathers of confederation. Um, and those are very specific fathers, not everyone's fathers. Um, and and so, so I, I partly wanna know this question because I think it helps us to think through that angle as well. I see that um, um, Jane Abbott and Alec Brown have said a farmer's market was there. And um, Alec Brown says it was a central market and I believe a post office before the CCOA. I don't know what the land held beforehand. So that's that's also really interesting, right? Um, that evolution of what what belongs to, what is the site for people to enter um, is, I'll, I'll stop now, but I, I um, really appreciate 
your your opening this up and your responses. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, yeah, just as maybe one last comment to the the post office in the central market. I mean, when I think of those places, I think of them as you know generally ex, you know accessible places. You know, um, whereas if anybody's been to the Confederation Center of the Arts, like it is a real like walled in <laughs> sort of space. The accessibility isn't, I say, one of its um, defining characteristics. But well, there's also this thing. You know, you the stairs are little. So there's this, I don't know, there's this, I don't even, I'm trying to think about your body position as you approach the center, as you come up from the street, like, are you looking up at it? Like, what's the, what is the, the position demanded of your body as you're, as you're approaching the site that even also belongs to its, to its imposition in, in a sense, it's imposing nature, which of course is what it was meant to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And ironically enough, you know, what undermines concrete more than water? <laughs> we have a question from, uh, thank you, Karen, that was awesome. And I, and I think these are, again, we should, uh, these, are, these are wonderful questions that can inform the workshop that's gonna be happening tomorrow as well. Uh, so everyone keep, keep, keep all this in mind. Jordan, you had a question, maybe you wanna put your video on because it's more fun to sort of have someone on, if you're comfortable with that and you can ask your question uh, sort of live and virtual. Sure. Hi. Um, I don't think I have video, but I can definitely speak. Um, Angela, I, what I, something I really appreciate about your work is that it's in like the public space in the library in a space where like people can encounter it, not necessarily, you know, searching out artwork or, or that meaning, but, you know, then they enter the library in this public building and it's just there. And then, you know, then they can have this experience that they maybe weren't looking for, weren't planning on having. And I also appreciate that a lot of the works you showed in the presentation um, were in public spaces like Janet, Janet Cardiff's work. Um, you know, it was, it was accessible for people to download on their phone and then experience in this public space. And a lot of the works were also um, directly like, you know, in the environment, in a, in a place that they were about, you know, I'm thinking about like Lindsay Dobbins work, which, you know, took place directly on, on the beach in the Magdalene Islands. Um, so I'm just wondering about like what what about those qualities of of, of public um, and directness um, in accessible spaces um, is is valuable and and why do you think it's important? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I think just maybe from my own experience of putting work in the the public library, I, I found this really like the conversations that emerged and even the you know seeing so many faces that aren't familiar faces inside of a gallery. You know, Halifax is a, a small community in the sense that, you know, in the arts community, you're often seeing familiar people, but, you know, at the, while setting up and then at the opening of that, you know, most people there I didn't know. And, and um, the kinds of conversations we had were, you know, people personally relating to the work or wanting to know more or sharing kind of, you know, um, an experience or um, um, a way that they um, were seeing the work. So I think, I think like now more than ever, the kind of urgency of, of bringing art into the public, I mean, this is of course not a new thing, but um, is important, especially when we're talking about, you know, um, these kinds of like well, difficult histories, you know, th these are in a way all of our histories, you know, we, we, we all have a different role to play in, um, in um, I wanna say reclaiming, but reconciling. And so, um, yeah, I think that the public space is a really um, important place for that. And also in terms of access, you know, um, I keep thinking of the parallels between the kind of physical um, effects of the CCOA and the renovation and that, and, you know, thinking about making it an accessible split space and how that word access extends out physically but also with regards to what we're talking about and so you know really interrogating this idea of access and how more than ever now art is something you know we've seen through this pandemic um, isolation that we 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 need um, and how you know different conversations can be had that can't be had elsewhere so um, yeah I think that that public spaces you know, a way of kind of reclaiming this often like corporatized or this kind of 
non-public public space um, is in itself a kind of counter um, counter monumental or counter counter gesture. That answers your question. Awesome. There's a couple more questions here. This one is from Katie. Um, I don't know if Katie's audio was enabled, so I will maybe I'll just read it. Uh, I'll read it for you, Katie. And there's a clarification also. So. Katie says, many of the works that you presented were deeply personal. The artists were engaging with spaces or places where they were from or had a familial connection to. I know in your work, Foray, you were considering mass graves and sites of human atrocity. How do you think the nature of an artist's relationship to the place they are seeking to represent impacts a final work? Is the artist's self and their personal relationship to a site ultimately the point of entry for work creation, or in the case of Foray, were you able to enter through a place of imagination and listening? And very quickly, there's a clarification that says, what do you think is the role of the artists or maybe spectator self in these counter mapping projects? Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's like, um, I mean, we all have a different relationship to um, hmm, the work that we make, our own histories. Um, but like, yeah, I have to kind of like step back and think about that a bit. Um, I think in the making of art, you can't help but have a personal relationship to what you're doing. So, you know, um, maybe like the way I'm describing, um, you know, working in this way that is sort of, you know, um, maybe like engaging with a critical perspective of how we sort of delineate or look at or understand or value space is, is coming out of, you know, um, you know, training and I want to say the indoctrination of uh, design practice and, you know, um, this kind of very analytical and, you know, commercial way of understanding space. But fundamentally, like working from a desire to have a more meaningful relationship to these places where um, I'm working. So in terms of like the artists and their personal work, if you if you look at the artists, um, like artist statements or bios, um, it becomes clear what that relationship is and what th that relationship is that they're working from. But I also think that the engaging with histories, so say, for example, Cardiff in the um, in the Bahnhof, the train station, who's, you know, looking at this, this history of this place as a place of site of deportation of um, Jewish people to concentration camps, you know, while that might not be her history, that history is something that we all reconcile with. So I think, or have to reconcile or, or have to deal with is all of our history in that sense. So, um, yeah, I think in, in relation to kind of the current, you know, um, if you look at when that work was made in 2017, you know, um, contemporary sort of political issues, the work becomes relevant. So I think engaging with a historical context and bringing that into the present is a way of inviting community and a public to, to also think about, you know, in that case, how the past influences the present or uh, kind of Sorry, kind of getting long-winded there, but yeah, I don't know exactly how to answer that question. Sorry. Uh, it, Katie, if you have a follow-up to that, you can, you can add that now. But in the meantime, we also have uh, Yolanda who's um, asking, uh, do you know of other Black artists who are working in counter-mapping? And if anyone else can maybe also, who's part of this group can also answer if, if you also are familiar with artists as well. Mm -hmm. Counter, yeah, counter mapping, I feel like is such a, like we could broaden that term and apply it in many ways. Like one artist who comes to mind, and I don't know if I would say exactly counter mapping, but the way I'm thinking of it is more about narrative and um, sort of telling, you know, historical narratives is Letitia Fraser in um, her painting practice. I don't know if people are familiar with um, Letitia, but, you know, I'm thinking of, you um, her kind of paintings of everyday life. Um, and, you know, she even uses like um, in some of her paintings, the quilt as a backdrop. Um, but really what I, I find interesting is they come like many of these works from such a personal um, point of view, such a kind of perspective of lived experience of, um, you know, telling the day to day in 
um, you know, in the in this form of painting. Um, and so I think of like, um, I think of, you know, in, in art itself, um, I don't know, this, this idea of, of where you work from or what you work in relation to, in terms of a canon or what have you, I think sometimes it's difficult or there's a lot of sort of, um, yeah, it's difficult to know how to work from a personal account or how personal work can be. But um, yeah, I guess I, my answer to that would, would be um, Letitia because I, I, or I think of Shanti Gray, Grant, sorry, and um, you know, um, the spoken word and the written word um, as a way of um, telling stories and reclaiming a sort of um, absence of historical narrative. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't, if there are any more, I don't see any more questions. Um, of course, there is a, there, there's a workshop which we are very, very excited to have as many of you uh, here as possible to attend, uh, to sort of really workshop these ideas, to bring your own research creation activities to the, to the Zoom workshop <laughs> situation that we're gonna be creating here. Uh, I wanna thank Angela again for, uh, for your presentation, asking those questions and uh, very grateful for that. Um, I wanna just very quickly before we sign off, I wanna, I wanna share my screen again and, uh, and just sort of go through um, what's happening for the rest of the day. So we have a reminder that today at two o'clock, we have um, an artist talk uh, with three amazing artists and it's gonna be, it's gonna be um, facilitated by our, our collaborator, um, Dr. Carla uh, Townken. And it's going to be Ursula Johnson, Peter Moran, and Deanna Bowen, and that's going to be great. So please um, come here at uh, come at two o'clock Eastern time, or sorry, Halifax time, because we're Atlantic Standard Time. That's where we are. Uh, tomorrow will be the workshop again. Uh, please let Jordan know that you'll be attending the the workshop, um, so we can make sure that you have access, so you can be a panelist, and you can share your screen. Um, that will be tomorrow at ten a.m. And they're on the website here, you can see that there's access to, uh, as I mentioned before, the folder that has um, photos and um, photos and site maps and all sorts of information for you to be able to reference and to um, maybe perhaps work off of when we're thinking about the Confederation Center for the Arts. Um, so those of you that maybe haven't been there or aren't in PI or have been there a long time ago can reference that and even work off of that work as well, print it out, do some work onto it and then maybe take a photo with your iPhone and upload it to the folder, which Jordan will provide you with. And then finally, at two o'clock, we have another round table discussion about curation in the age of decolonization with uh, Dr. Julie Nagam, Dr. Heather uh, Igliarte, and Aidan Gillis from the ATNS Indigenous Arts Programmer. So lots of lots of stuff happening this weekend. Um, I want to thank all of you so much for coming today, uh, for joining us, and I really look forward to seeing all of you in a couple hours, uh, virtually again, with uh, an amazing artist talk. And yeah, take care, everybody, and we will see you very soon. A reminder that it's a different Zoom link, so please click on the Zoom link that's on the website for two o'clock. Every Zoom link is different. Thank you again so much, everybody. Please take care of yourselves, be safe, and we'll see you very soon.